Yep, yep. Uh, it's hey, uh, Tom we're connecting Reese. now. I think this may happen this time. Okay, Susan Sam is having snacks. There, there we go, Juan. Okay, we're live. We're going? Is it coming? We're yes. live. Good work. Okay, good. Sorry, folks. We had some technical difficulties, but uh, it sounds like we're I, live. I, I thought we were going to have to pull your check for this week out of the mail. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Uh, well, welcome, folks, and uh, sorry for for the little bit of a delay there. Yeah. Well, listen. Why don't we start with uh, Tommy? Uh, Juan's going to. Well, Rick, be before we do that, we want to. We, we there's a couple of uh, there's an announcement at least that we want to make, right? Oh yes. Go ahead. You want to make an announcement? Then the announcement is, you know, now that summer is kind of here, we've decided to move the happy hours from Fridays at, uh, to Thursdays, same time, 5 p.m. on Thursdays. That allows people. That are going away for the for the weekend and whatnot to be able to go home and not hold their family back saying no i gotta be there for the happy hour i can't go right because i know you're all having mm -hmm. these conversations so <laughs> we don't want to put you in that predicament so we're going to move the happy hour starting next week to thursdays at 5 p.m instead of fridays and we'll make an uh, announcement on that yeah and we're going to try to uh, do this you know every thursday but a uh, summer uh comes upon us right and and the uh, situation think more and more things open i think you know there may be a time where we don't have a happy hour so our thoughts will be right. with you anyway. but, but we'll let you all know for sure you'll yep. see that on the floral therapy uh facebook group absolutely so juan you're drinking you're not drinking i'm your... drinking soda water because as i was telling these guys um something i ate for lunch just didn't sit well with me and i didn't want to risk having to, you know, disappear yeah. <laughs> on all you guys in the middle of the broadcast. Well, uh, sorry, you're not feeling great. Alec is drinking coffee and I'm drinking my LaCroix water for now, but I'm going to, I have the Voodoo Ranger as my uh, backup. Mm. So, and Tommy is drinking coffee. Yeah. Yes. Cool. So Tommy, why don't you tell us a, a little bit about, uh, this picture that Juan is going to put up because when I saw this, when you came to me uh, for the portfolio review, this, you know, this uh, stopped me in my tracks. I said, cause I didn't know what it was. So Juan's going to put this up and we're going to, you could talk about that for a little bit. And then we're going to have another picture, which is uh, shows a really uh, different side of you. Okay, here we go guys. Hold on. Okay. So, Everybody should be seeing that image now. Yep. So many, many years ago, I ran a paint store and a little paint factory. Well, I didn't run the paint factory, but I ran the paint store part of it. And it was actually a, the very first paint factory in the United States that ever manufactured and sold to the public uh, acrylic house paint, which is now, of course, everything's acrylic. But we were like, man, everybody that worked there had to be a master color manager because that was our little niche. We could people could come in and match colors and stuff, get their colors matched, which was not as easy as it is today. And, uh, and so when matching colors, you'd put the color in the, in the gallon of paint and then you would look at it and then you'd add a little bit more and it, you know, sometimes it'd take 30, 40 minutes. But so I got looking every now and again, I would just take the color and I'd give it a little jerk and a little push, put the lid back on there and give it a little jerk shake. And I started seeing really interesting things coming out. And uh, this was actually one of the first or second that I said, I said, I think I'm on to something here. This is, this is, I don't know what it is, but it's, uh, and this is yellow oxide pigment with lamp black. And it all happened in less than a second. Really? This, all this flow happened in less than a second. It was like, you put the lid back on there, you put the cover in there, and you just go, boop. I don't know if you go, boop, like that. And keep it, and, and that's what happened. And, and over the years, I just kept doing them. And I probably did a thousand gallons that way, and maybe got, I think I got about 65 or 70 that uh, I think are cool. But, you know, you, then you just put the lid back on the, on the shaker, put it on the shaker, go. Give the man his paint once you got it finished. And so, so, so Tommy, we're looking into the can of paint right now. Yeah, that's the top of the gallon of paint. Wow, that's pretty. So cool. The way I the way I did it was whenever I saw anything, I had a tripod set up on my match color matching counter, 
And we actually had, even back then, we had a color balance fluorescent lights because, you know, when you're shooting film, you, if you had fluorescent lights, it would, all the colors would come off wrong. So I had a macro lens set up and I'd have the uh, camera set up. And if, it, if I said, I need, oh, that looks cool. I'd slide it under there, <laughs> wow. whack it five different shots and I'd slide it back out and put it on shaker and take uh, guys funny. So it was like, you know, this lasted in, in existence, maybe 30 seconds, <laughs> you know, wow. but, so if uh, someone wants pretty... to do something like this, can they just go to the store and buy a, a, some paint and add a pigment to it? Yeah. But it was, it, the thing about it is it was only the first shot. I mean, it was only the first jerk or first shake that did it. So in other words, you know, yeah, you, yeah. Could, you could go like that and then that would work. But if you started doing like this, then it all blend together and be like, you know, all the other swirly paint things that you see. I mean, and uh, yeah. And if I was going to do it now, which I can't afford because you get each one of them down <laughs> the paint and it was yeah. like, but you know, but uh, you could, you could do it where you would do it maybe in a pan and then put the paint on there and just have the top, but you got to have it, you got to have the lid on it so that you can actually jerk it. And it's like, uh, some thermodynamics guy told me it was like a slosh dynamics because it's inside of a closed container. Wow. So, uh, and that's the reason it comes back on itself and all. I don't know. I mean, it's. Alec, what do you think? Oh, I'm Alex, sorry. Alex letting people in. Sorry. Or kicking yeah. people out. <laughs> Now, I, I mean, I, I like it. I, you know, it's one of those pictures that as I, we talked about last week. And you look at them and you don't know exactly what you're looking at. Right. right. You're, you're trying to figure it out and it makes you think. It makes your brain, you know, you activate your brain trying to figure out, is this rust? Is it, you know, I, you know, I didn't think it was paint. I thought maybe I have no idea. You know, all sorts of things were going to my head for the first time I saw it. Well, it's pretty cool. And I bet you, Tommy, that that kept you a little sane also at work, right? little distraction a little bit of uh you know <laughs> oh yeah yeah i mean it was funny. like yeah i mean and you know the customers didn't mind it because of the fact that you know every now and again i said you've won the lottery you get your dang on paint your coat you know you get your gallon of paint you just got to wait for a few seconds right. so Tommy, Tommy, <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna show one more picture uh that you took but if people want to follow you where can they follow you we know on the facebook page and a lot of people are, co are commenting on your work there but you have a website or Instagram page? I don't, I got to figure out an Instagram, but the only thing I've got up is uh, on Guru Shots. I'm, I'm, I've am i been playing that Guru Shots thing for years. Cool. Well, you know what? In the in the Facebook group, why don't you just put a link next time you, know, you post one of these wonderful pictures because you have dozens. And again, you're a true artist. I looked at this and say, you know, I look at pictures like this. I say, you know, I'm a photographer. You know, this person's an artist. So listen, we have a, one more picture. <clears throat> that uh, we thought Tommy sent more than a few. And uh, that was, the uh, first one was our favorite. And this is another favorite. So, you know, I think this captures a special moment, but Tommy, go ahead. What do you like about this picture? And, and when was it taken? It was taken, uh, let's see, the, the one that's reading is now 45. So he's, that was taken about, and the one that's uh, pulling the bicycle is about 42. So uh, mm -hmm. that's my son's when they were, I was sitting on the front porch and they were, I saw that and I said, grab the camera, shoot the picture, <laughs> you know, it's not going to be sharp. I'm not going to be in focus, but I don't care, you know, that kind of thing, which is, it's in sharp enough, but uh, it's like old Kodachrome picture where you're shooting it one fifteenth of a second at Y1, F14 or something. So you can't really expect everything to be, uh, but yeah, that's one of my favorite shots of my children. Yeah, I, I, I love that it just captures a moment, this very special moment when people, uh, when kids read books and didn't have uh, iPads. <laughs> right? I hadn't thought about that. Yeah. But I, you know what, Juan and I and Alec were talking beforehand that, uh, you know, our pictures, Alec says his uh, camera is his microphone, which is going to be the title of his first book there. I'm encouraging him to write a book. Anyway, uh, now, this says a lot about you, that you submitted this picture in addition to your artwork. It shows you're a very sensitive, kind uh, person, I think. So uh, I love it. Juan, what do you say? 
Oh, absolutely. Same thing. I mean, it just, it reminds me, it's funny because I look at this picture, it reminds me some of the same kind of pictures that I cherish of my son right. when he was, when he was little, you know, um, I feel them, you know, most of them actually, I'm trying to think if I ever shot with any of any of his pictures on film. And I don't think I did because I had switched them to fully digital by the time he was born. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's just images, you know, that, that they just, they may not be technically perfect. They may not, they may have little flaws here and there, but it doesn't matter. They still tug at you and, you know, you, you go back to them over and over again. Yeah. And even though I don't know these guys, I, I can really uh, look into this picture. And I like the word you used, Juan. Uh, you said but, cherish. And right. I've known you for a long time. And you talk about your photographs, your wildlife, the fox and the Yellowstone and the bison and Yellowstone and these pictures from, uh, uh, you know, wherever, Sri Lanka. I never heard you use the word cherish. So I think that's really important that we do cherish these pictures the most. Stop, so Tommy- It stops time, Rick. It stops time. It definitely stops time. Uh, Anyway, we love it. So Tommy, stick around. Uh, thank you so much for being on the show. What's gonna happen now is Juan is going to share some of his amazing seascape pictures. Okay. Oh, with tips, with tips. <laughs> with tips, okay. So let me share that out. Give me a second here, guys. Share that. <clears throat> okay, can you guys see that? Yes. So I'm going to, hold on, I'm going to get rid of some of these distracting elements on the sides here. Um, so we, you know, what I figured is I have a bunch of images I want to show. I'm going to spend a little time on each, but not a long time. And I grouped them by location. Um, you know, why by location? Because I couldn't think of anything else to group them by. So, <laughs> so I'm going to start with images from Maine, some of my favorite images from Maine of all time that I've shot. Um, and, you know, their topic is seascapes, but, you know, for me, the seascapes is more about this, more than just about the sea, right? It's the environment, what's in the sea, what's interacting with this, with the sea and everything else that's in there. This image, you know, is at a location, I took this, I believe on the, during one of my workshops in Acadia, I used to run a bunch of workshops in Acadia National Park and here in Maine. Um, I may restart those. I've taken a break from them for a couple of years because I, I did that for like eight years straight and I was a little burnt out from doing them. But I'm thinking maybe for 2021 and may restart them. Um, and if you have ever been here, you know that this is a really tough spot to shoot this image. It's a really small space. There's usually a lot of people there. So you have to play nice, which, you know, for me, that's Believe it or not, one of the things that makes me that that makes me think about this image is playing nice because you're not seeing what's be, you don't see in the behind the scenes, but there's probably about 25 photographers all behind me or next to me or around me trying to get the same shot. Um, somewhere with my group and somewhere just um, you know just other photographers there. It's actually kind of getting a little crazy to go here, but this is a, a, a long exposure, not too too long. I think it's probably like five seconds or so. Actually, one second. I can see the settings up here. It's only one second at f five point six ISO one hundred. <clears throat> So another one, and I think I may have shown this in an earlier one. This is again from Acadia National Park. Uh, as you can see, I took this image on January 1st. I used to go every January 1st to Acadia National Park and watch the sunrise there. Why is because the, you know, supposedly the sun, it's the first place the sun hits in the continental United States. Um, not necessarily down here, but at the top of Cadillac Mountain. And, um, you can see a little bit of ice out there on the, on the, uh, on the rocks. And that's because it's January 1st, but it's on the coast. So there's not, the snow doesn't stick around for very long. And here, one of the things that I wanted to do is not just do a long exposure on the water, but have some of these amazing boulders in front of us kind of highlighted and really brought to light and really show how shiny and um, how they take the color of that sky that's, that, is, that is rising. <clears throat> really wide angle lens. I think this was shot at 16 millimeters. So really wide angle to try to capture everything. And these rocks are literally, you know, a couple inches away from my, from my lens. Nice. 
it took one a long time to arrange the rocks in those positions. In that Absolutely. Position. I mean, <laughs> well, every year about- it's interesting you say that because every year is different. Um, the winter completely rearranges the rocks. Some years, like this year, was actually a great year for the rocks because the 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 Boulder Beach. This this is called Boulder Beach. The rocks are kind of on a nice gentle slope. Sometimes they're all bunched up yeah. in a very sharp slope there. And it's not until like later in the year in summer or fall that they get kind of more, uh, they get flattened out. So every, but every year is different because the summer, the wind, the, the summer or the winter storms rearrange these rocks all the time. And one of my favorite things about this location is the sound that the rocks make as the surf comes in and out. It, it's, it's pretty, pretty re- remarkable. <clears throat> Again, another one where uh, my main subject, even though it's a seascape, is not really the sea. The sea plays kind of a secondary actor in the scene. And for any of you guys that are Forrest Gump aficionados, um, this actually lighthouse makes it into Forrest Gump. If you remember, Forrest Gump ran across the country. And as he went to the East Coast in the video, he basically runs up to this lighthouse. And then turns around and starts running back west. Um, This is Marshall Point, um, and it is a beautiful location. I've taken people here to photograph this. It's a great location also for astrophotography because the sky is pretty dark. And this lighthouse, because the light is a continuous light, it's not a revolving light, you get this beautiful kind of star shapes coming out of the lighthouse. Pretty cool. I didn't include that in here because you couldn't see the sky uh, for those images. Sorry, you couldn't see the, the, the ocean, the sea. So that's why it wasn't a seascape. But this is another perspective of that lighthouse. Um, and this is from a, uh, this is an infrared shot um, taken from a boat that was going out uh, past the lighthouse. And you can see some of the people standing on the lighthouse. And you can see also that it's, uh, even though it's ISO 100, it's still pretty, pretty grainy. Yeah, but that- But that I, I love, you know, one of the things that I like doing with, especially with seascapes um, is shooting infrared because it makes the water really interesting. In this case, it makes the water completely completely black. But in other cases, it doesn't make it completely black. You do get, you still get some texture um, texture in it. Sorry about I that. I really like the crop on that, you know, the really, you know, that looks like a panorama. Right, you know, and, and that was, you know, I did that deliberately only because, you know, there wasn't a lot of detail in the top and bottom, mm-hmm. right? There's a lot right. of, um, of dark um, in those areas, so, um, but, you know, as you guys have heard me say many times, I, I'm a sucker for these sort of panoramic shots. I love the, the cinematic aspect ratios. Mm-hmm. And uh, these are all still from Maine. This is a West Quoty Head, which is a very famous lighthouse. You, you may have seen it. It's one of those that have the, the uh, um, uh, Christmas candy twirl uh, color on it. But this was just as we were getting there. Um, to shoot this for sunset. For sun- no, we were going there for sunrise, sorry. Um, or after sunrise, we got there. And when I, what I was doing here is actually, um, the light wasn't exactly this color, even though there was a lot of uh, uh, sea smoke. What I did is I changed the uh, white balance on my camera, right? I consider the white balance, especially because we're shooting in raw as another creative option. So I changed my white balance to be very, very warm. So when I made the shot, you know, you got this incredibly warm glow of the sun. Now I could have done this also in um, while editing in uh, in Lightroom or ACR, but I decided to do it on the camera there so that I could show the people that I was with kind of the effect. Um, and I obviously love this the lobster boat going through the, through the water. I wish I had gotten them straight in the middle. But you can see that I was fumbling around and changing my <laughs> my white balance settings, <laughs> and I missed the boat just by a little bit, being right in the in line with the sun. But I think it still worked. Are you getting some nice comments, Juan? May I interrupt? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Uh, Tommy says I like the highlights on the bottom instead of just pure black. So the little reflections there, I think, are nice. Uh, David Stern says um, you could talk about a life. He asked if it was a life pixel conversion. Oh, uh, if you're yes. infrared. Yep. Yep. Okay. So the super color that. life pixel conversion. Uh, about the bridge, love uh, the composition and coloring of the bridge and the contrasty sky. Nice for the lighthouse. And on one of them earlier, I was going through, 
Robert says, uh, I think it might have been your first one, almost a Norman Rockwellian. Oh, yeah, that's the, pretty the, nice. Probably the lighthouse. Yeah, that, thank yes. you. So yeah. you, have a, you have a lot of good comments here. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Yeah, so this is my little um, infrared camera. As a, uh, I shoot Sony. So this is Sony 6000, the little crop sensor camera that's converted to infrared. And it's, you know, I decided to do this because it's nice and small, so I can throw it in my camera bag. And if I use it, great. If I don't use it, it didn't take up that much room in my camera bag. Now, this one is, you know, kind of a lucky shot more than anything. And it's probably one of my absolute favorite images. But it's also, I almost screwed it up at the same time. Um, and this was shot, uh, again, during the workshop. I was at, we were at the top of uh, Cadillac Mountain. Um, and we had lots of fog. And we actually... Before this, we were out in an area where the fog was kind of streaming over the mountain. And I was shooting a time lapse of the fog kind of, you know, coming over the ridge of the mountain and spilling on the other side. And when we got to the spot after that bank of fog moved through, I saw this image. And what's neat about this image, if you know this area, there's two lighthouses in this image that you can see. Egg Rock on the lower right. Um, and... Oh, I'm going to, I'm drawing a blank now. And then one at the top, um, it's, uh, it'll come to me later. Um, and, uh, and you can see that if you look up here at the data, it's a JPEG image because when I was shooting a time-lapse, I had set my camera to shoot JPEGs and I forgot to change it back to raw. And I almost, you know, you know, I, I, I hated myself for having done that because there's so much detail in here. Luckily, the exposure is a great exposure and I still have tons of detail in this image. You know, I can zoom in, for example, on this lighthouse and you can see still all the detail of the, of the, of the, um, of the, the lighthouse at the top and the windows. You, know, you can see the buildings. You can see all the lobster boats out here in the water. Look at this, all the way around. So sometimes you do get lucky even though you know, we screw up. And I, to me personally, one of the things I really love about this is sort of the ethereal quality of the, all that sea smoke that we could see down on from being on top of Cadillac Mountain. Got a lot of nice comments about that. That's not a bad screw up, Freddie Clark says. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was lucky really that I was able to salvage that even though it was a JPEG. Um, you know, this is again in another workshop in Acadia. This is on the little visited part of Acadia called the Scudic Peninsula. And I love to go here to shoot crashing waves, especially if you're there for sunrise, you're able to do stuff like this where you get the, the sun coming up and you get all the waves crashing silhouetted. One of the cool things, something that I've never been able to do, this place is about two and a half hours for me, um, from my house, well, maybe like three hours now because I moved it. I moved, so I live about 30 minutes further out. Um, is this is a place, if you ever get to go here, you're here in the summer and there's a storm coming in, this is the place to be for a storm because these waves, as they come crashing into these rocks, they can go 50, 100 feet high. They're just incredible. And I have, I've seen pictures of people, friends that have been able to go out there doing a good storm. It's best if you have that incoming tide and a storm and the, the waves are just out of this world. And I've seen pictures with people who are just tiny little things at the bottom with this wave crashing right above them. Uh, an amazing spot. But getting here for sunrise, if you can make it, is a, an amazing experience. If you're staying in Acadia, um, you, this is about an hour and a half drive from Acadia. So you got to go, you know, cause it's on the coast. You got to go inland and then go back out onto this peninsula. Um, there's a new campground here. That's amazing, beautiful place to stay. Or during the day, you can take a boat ferry in the summer from Acadia over to this, to this location. But obviously you can't take the ferry and be there for sunrise. You got to drive out there. Hey Juan, I have to say before we move on to the next one, the, People yeah. that have been watching just have been motionless in terms of the way that they were captured by that by that image. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so yeah, so it, like, it, here in Maine we have no shortage of lighthouses. I love going to shoot lighthouses. As a matter of fact, I'm putting together a little lighthouse lighthouse tour. But one of the challenges with doing that is a lot of lighthouses are far apart. 
So you can't just hit them, you know, kind of from one day hit more than two or something like that. But I'm putting something together in an area. There's a nice concentration of lighthouses to try to hit like four, five, six lighthouses in, in a span of two, excuse me, of two days. Uh, this is Cuckold's Lighthouse. And it's a little island about, I don't know, a couple hundred yards off of a pier that juts out onto the water. And we were out there having a few, you know, glasses of wine, enjoying the sunset while I just snapped this, this little picture. You know, I kind of struggled a little bit with my composition here, you know, where I was going to place the, the lighthouse. And I think, you know, after all the cropping and, and jiggling at the end of the day, I think this, I like this composition the most because there's a little, if you get nice and close, you can see there's a little um, seagull up here. And I think that that kind of balances out the image. If you look closely, closely enough. Trying to keep people in the, in the frame as well. Um, this is actually right from Bar Harbor, right in Acadia National Park with a full moon rising as the sun was setting. And someone was out there trying to, trying to make some images. <clears throat> couple of images from the top of uh, Cadillac Mountain. And this is a beautiful location for both sunrises and sunsets. You'll have sunrises from one side and sunsets on the other side of the mountain. Um, this is a, uh, I believe this is a sun, yeah, this is a sunrise. And this is a sunset, almost from the same location. These are the porcupine islands that you're seeing out there. And again, trying to keep some elements in your foreground so you're not just shooting the sky or the, sorry, the, the ocean, you're not doing just the, the seascape, but trying to add a little bit of interest into the scene. Think about the balance of your composition as well. <clears throat> now moving a little bit to Alaska, kind of on the other side of the country, on the other coast. Um, this is a seal, uh, seal rock, sea lion rock, sorry, sea lion rock, which is a rock out on the, out on the ocean, just outside of Baranoff Island, which is absolutely covered in sea lions and the water the seas are incredibly rough as you get out there you have to have a pretty intrepid um boat captain this is our friend uh, captain dennis that takes us out here right 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 against this rock and believe it or not this is a panorama which is really difficult to do when you have it's such roiling water um it took me hours and hours and hours to be able to, you know, fix the water. Because even then, no matter how fast you shoot that panorama, the water is moving. So each frame is not going to completely line up where the water is. But it, it took me hours of cloning and masking to be able to put it all together in such a way that it looks nice and seamless. And to me, you know, I've been out here to this location dozens of times and it's, you know, and I photographed this under a lot of different conditions and this is still my favorite because it conveys to me, you know, the action of the water, what this location is like. It kind of puts me in its in in place. The good thing about this and what but my favorite thing about this image is I can view this and kind of relive the moment without smelling the sea lions. <laughs> yeah, right. Because <laughs> when that wind is going the wrong way, you literally want to hurl over the side of the ship. <laughs> <clears throat> A couple more uh, images, black and white conversions onto uh, uh, Alaskan seascape. This is on the inside passage. <clears throat> and I like this image, but to me, it's missing something, right? So I've been able to sometimes waking up really early before anybody else go out and get lucky and be able to photograph whales fluking um, as the sun is coming up with a nice, um, a nice landscape and a nice seascape or another seascape with a nice fluke coming up. Again, doing that nice long cinematic crop that I like and um, keeping the image as simple as possible. Make sure, making sure that my subjects are obvious that people are seeing what I want them to see and nothing else. Um, couple more, right? Do I have, yeah, let me do, let me do a, a few more Rick and then uh, you can sure. take over. This is in Iceland. Um, just outside, this is the Black Beach, outside of the uh, Ice Lagoon, um, where all the uh, broken pieces of uh, glacier, uh, glacial ice kind of comes out onto the ocean and it gets floats back onto, onto the sand and gets stranded 
And um, one of the best times to be there is for sunrise. <clears throat> and um, one of the things I was trying to capture here was a little bit of motion as the waves are coming in and battering on this amazingly beautiful clear ice that's out there. And, you know, it's kind of challenging because, you know, you're shooting in very low light and you're trying to capture motion. And I was trying to exaggerate the motion. So if you look at my setting here, um, I was shooting this at one sixth of a second handheld at uh, uh, F11. So try to make sure I have enough depth of field in here um, and trying to slow down my shutter. So I'm at one sixth of a second to try to get that motion in the scene. And I love the way water shows itself when you do these long exposures. And you know, the, the thing is there's no set exposure. You gotta be playing around with those, with that um, uh, with your shutter speed to see what kind of effect that water is doing. Cause the way the water moves and the speed at the wa which the water is moving is going to dictate what, you know, what the image is going to look like. So you got to play around with all sorts of kind of settings. And another one, this is again, another kind of 0.8 seconds and long exposure to try to soften the sky and during that, um, during that sunrise morning with a nice, interesting piece of foreground as well. You know, and I can never, do you know, Rick, do you remember how to pronounce this location in Iceland? No, I can't pronounce it <laughs> in the waterfall. I can't pronounce anything in Iceland. <laughs> no, the only, only waterfall I could pronounce is dental floss. Yeah, dental floss, because floss means waterfall right. <laughs> in Icelandic. Um, and this is, you remember, oh, actually, that was, that was for the other, for the Tuesdays, right? Phototherapy Tuesdays, where yeah. we had that sunrise, blue on one side and orange mm -hmm. on the other. You know, because I love those kinds of situations where you have something like that. You have, you know, the sunset setting on one side, you know, a nice blue sky on the other kind of gives you that progression um, of the day with something interesting that uh, draws your attention as your main subject. Okay, Rick, do you want to awesome, yeah. you want to take it from here? You got a lot of great comments here. Uh, it's really cool. Okay, uh, okay. Speaking of Iceland, I'm going to now share my screen here. Share a keynote presentation. Share. Thanks so much, Juan. I hear and go play. So we're good. Yep, I can okay. see your images. You're good. This was taken in the uh, Glacial Lagoon, and I have this here because I, I think it's my favorite like seascape picture. It is, uh, we were in the Zodiac. There were uh, seven other people in the Zodiac with me, and we were actually had tears in our eyes because we're looking around, and everywhere we looked, it is just so beautiful. So the reason I have it in here is because, you know, for me, this is a relatively, you know, you, you said, Rwanda, you have like, it was like a dumb luck shot, right? Right. <laughs> you know, how could you go wrong here? I did use right. a polarizing filter. I broke the rule of putting the horizon line in the center. But I think when it comes to uh, reflections, for me, for me, that works. So I thought this was actually when I took it, I thought it was uh, one iceberg, but it's actually uh, two. You see one on the left and one on the right. So the point is this, uh, you know, the mood matters most in all our pictures. And I was also lucky because, <laughs> because of the, uh, the still water and the overcast sky. Photographing on an overcast day is relatively easy to get a good exposure. On a high contrast day like this, it's a lot harder. So what I do is I always expose for the highlights. I have my histogram on. I make sure I don't have a spike on the right. And, uh, and I have my highlight alert on. So that ensures that, and you know, I'll take a test shot, ensures that the highlights aren't overexposed and are blown out. But Juan and I talk about separation a lot. And so I was standing up in the Zodiac after I asked the, uh, the Zodiac driver if it was okay, because you definitely don't want to, even though you have a survival suit on, you don't want to fall in this icy water. The little bit of separation between the piece of the ice on the top and the bottom, I think is important. The other thing is this, we got close. And the closer you are to the subject, the more intimate the photograph becomes. So I think about that with people, think about that with seascapes, icecapes, landscapes, flowers, whatever. So I think that's an important thing to remember that the closer you are to the subject, the more important. Uh, the, now here, when we did the uh, Phototherapy Tuesday, these are out of order. This is the other shot. Juan had a comment on one of the panoramas from one of our members. He said, I'd like to see that flipped. So I flipped this 
And I just think it's so symmetrical. Again, it's a lucky shot. And it's kind of fun to do this. So I would encourage our our, uh, our listeners, our viewers, our members to uh, do this because, you know, I could probably zoom in here and make a couple of cool pictures like Tommy's that would be abstracts that I think would be kind of cool. Well, uh, I think, Rick, one of the things that that does is kind of remove some of the reality. So it makes people think and look at it, trying to figure out what it is, right? Right. Like in the center, I see like a little, I see a face, I see a body, uh, I see a couple mm -hmm. of faces in there. I'm sure I see Tommy, an alien. I think someone said that. Yeah, Geraldo that sees too. an alien. Yeah. Uh, I do too. Now that he mentions it, I see the alien yeah, in the middle. I, I definitely, you know what, I'm going to crop that and put that up and ask people like, right, it's the alien's face with the eyes and the mouth and it's, it's whole body, yeah. right, with two arms. Yeah. Looks like it yeah. has like a, a skeleton body. And <laughs> That's the, pretty funny. <laughs> that is pretty funny. So Gerardo's from Mexico. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, <clears throat> I'm big on making pictures and on the workshops, we talk about this a lot. And it you know, if you're photographing a still life, if, if you're photographing a person, adding props or whatever, there's a big difference between taking a picture and making a picture. This is taken down in Antarctica. And what I like about this picture is that this, uh, all these little pieces of ice kind of frame almost perfectly uh, the, under, the bottom side, the underwater side of the iceberg. Well, here's the first picture. Uh, and I wanted to frame it. You know, here, this is kind of boring where I think this picture has more impact. Again, this was taken on overcast day. It's not that hard to take a picture, get a good exposure on overcast day. This was taken with a 16, uh, 16 to 35 millimeter lens at 16 millimeters. And I try to get everything in focus because I want it to look like it looks to my eye. So everything in the back is in focus and the pieces of ice aren't focused. So wide angle lens, small aperture and focusing one third into the scene is a good idea. But anyway, we came upon this beautiful, this beautiful uh, uh, piece of ice, this ice flow here. And I said to the Zodiac driver, could we just drive back and forth, back and forth? And we're basically kind of like herding the pieces of ice into position. So we're making a picture. So I'd like all of you guys to think about this, that what no matter what you're doing, there's a big difference between just taking a picture and making a picture. Nice enough shot, but this picture, I think, is a little more balanced. And talk about making a picture. Uh, you know, the ice in Antarctica, as you saw, uh, is amazing in Iceland. You know, I just, I actually I go to Antarctica for the blue ice. I thought I was going first time for the wildlife, but now I go back and back again because I love the blue ice, like you saw Juan's picture in, in Iceland. Blue ice is just like amazing. Anyway, here's Susan and I, you might think we're like on uh, thin ice here. Uh, you might think this was taken in Iceland or Antarctica or whatever, but actually this picture was taken in Croton on Hudson, New York. Uh, Juan knew this, so thanks for, and uh, Alec knew it, so thanks for not giving it away. There are condos in the back and that other arrow goes to where we're on the ice. But again, we create our own reality by cropping. You know, photography is uh, subtractive, whereas painting is additive. So what we try to do as photographers, we crop out what we don't want, we subtract to create the kind of a picture that we want to take. And I had a lot shorter hair there. This was taken before the uh, pandemic. And if you look closely at the bottom, you can see that piece of ice is, is resting on the bottom of the, of the riverbank there. <laughs> Okay, this picture uh, taken on the same beach that Juan was at, and someone commented on Juan's picture, that nice layering. So we have that layer of the layering as far as, you know, <clears throat> subjects in the scene. We have the piece of ice in the foreground uh, is one layer, the ice crashing. You saw that Juan had the same kind of effect crashing on the piece of ice behind it, and you have the waves behind. I love shooting on overcast days because, you know, the mood really does matter most, and, you know, you know, if you if you watch movies uh, or TV shows, a lot of especially movies, a lot of the scenes are shot, you know, before sunrise or after sunset or with big scrims over them uh, to diffuse the light. So we get this nice, soft, even light. So the layers add a sense of depth and dimension. Shooting at an angle adds a sense of depth and dimension. And I'm using a slow shutter speed, uh, probably a quarter of a second to blur the water. Uh, Juan talks about this when he talks about his wildlife photography. Uh, gesture is so important, right, Juan? Gesture yes, is so gesture important. Yep. You know, when it comes to birds, wings up, wings down, right? Uh, you want to see an expression on maybe the animal's face or some interaction. So when you're photographing seascapes and water, gesture is very, very important too. So I like the way the uh, 
the uh, water's crashing on that piece of ice in the background. And I like the gesture of how the water is caressing the, uh, the piece of ice in the foreground. But here's the original color shot. It was taken on an overcast day. The reason it looks underexposed is because it is. <laughs> and not, it's not technically, under, technically it's underexposed, but again, because I underexposed for the highlights, I didn't want to lose any detail in any of the bright areas of the scene. So on the left, you see the histogram for that original picture. And you see that I didn't make any adjustments. And on the right, you see the uh, enhanced histogram with my adjustments. Now, I know a lot of you have heard, you know, move the histogram to the right. Well, if I had moved it all the way to the right, those highlights would have been overexposed and washed out. So yes, move the histogram to the right, but make sure your highlights aren't overexposed and washed out. So here's the color shot, you know, nice enough, but there's not a lot of color in there. So actually I'd like to hear if people want to comment. Some people might like the uh, color better than the black and white. And when I'm playing with uh, black and white, uh, I think Juan, you use it. Alec, Nick Color, Nick Silver Effects Pro, Freddie. Absolutely, Freddie. Nick Silver Effects Pro is a great plugin. So what I do is on the left there for this one, I picked full dynamic range, which brought out the full dynamic range of the file. And then over on the right, I chose a red filter. In a Juan shot, you saw that here, that nice with infrared, uh, black water and black sky. Well that red filter in Nick Color FX Pro and, and the other uh, programs that are and plugins that are out there. That'll give you that nice uh, feeling of uh, a dramatic black and white. And in black and white, just one more tip, uh, contrast is king. So one of the reasons why I like this again is because there's a lot of contrast. So I took this picture in uh, Antarctica and I'm sure you could all see that it looks kind of like a polar bear with the eyes and the ears and the mouth and the uh, and the paws and looks like it's on its back and you can see its knee and its foot up in the air and some people see a lion on the right but we're in a zodiac again driving around one of my favorite seascape pictures but i'd like all of you to ask yourselves where and why do you point your camera and oftentimes oftentimes it's because of things we recognize. So this is called a zoomorphic image because it comes from uh, the Greek zoo animal and morph uh, shape or form. So I think it's important to, to ask ourselves, why do we point our cameras? Why do we take certain types of pictures? Talk about making a picture. <clears throat> We're driving around in the Zodiac and I see this, uh, I see this uh, piece of ice. And I said, wow, this looks really interesting, but this picture is basically a compositional mess. There's like nothing going on. <laughs> so, right? This is what yeah. I call it. So I, and I, I took it. So I'm proud to call it a compositional mess. So I asked the Zodiac driver, can we just hang out? Can we wait? Because the, the water, it was moving and we're driving around, we're driving around. And about a half hour later, I was able to get, you know, one of my favorite shots from, uh, from Antarctica. <laughs> So again, snapshot to a more creative shot. I talk about moving around. This is another zoomorphic image. What does this look like? Juan, Alec, anything? Yeah, I'm not good at this. Uh, I, once people point them out, I can see them, but no, well, I don't it looks see to it. me like a seahorse. Looks like a horse on the right. Oh, and now I see it. Yes, you got to try. Okay. You yes, I see you it. See, you see that with the even the eye, the thick eyelashes over the horse's eye and the mm -hmm. and the mouth. So to me, you know, maybe I'd like to get to, uh, Tommy smiling. I see him over there. So I like this picture. I like the raindrops. This was taken up in uh, Iceland too. But here's the piece of ice when I came around it, when I first found it. So the tip is, well, one, if you're going to be shooting in the water, wear boots, right? <laughs> wear rubber boots or, uh, right, Juan? Rubber boots or I, I bet on the beach you had either Z, uh, Neos or boots, right? Right. So right. you need these, you need these, but you want to move around the subject. So here it just looks like, you know, to me, a boring piece of ice. But by moving around and looking, I was able to get what I thought looked like, uh, looked like uh, a seahorse or a horse. Again, I take the color out of the scene because we, when we take out some of the color, we take out uh, some of the reality. This picture was taken uh, in Antarctica also. And another thing we want to think about as photographers is negative space and positive space. So the ice is the uh, positive space and the water in the back is the negative space. So a lot of people see different things here. Uh, 
Some people see like a bear on the right. Some people see Snoopy on the left. Some people see Pac-Man going down on the right in the negative space. Some people see a bear on the left. So there's a lot of di different things I think going on here. So it's important to, again, ask ourselves where and why, you know, do we photograph? And that piece of ice is actually behind a piece of ice in the middle. You could see a part of it. So, uh, you know, you guys know that I have my one picture promise. If they, you're in a situation, you can only take one picture. Now, what would it be? Everybody would take a different type of picture. But that is my that's the picture that I took. Uh, someone uh, said, I hope you're going to show some seascapes from Oregon. So I have to show uh, one of my favorites. It's taken a several years ago with my friend Alex Morley. We co-lead workshops there. Uh, this is in Strawberry Fields. Uh, you've been there, right? Strawberry Hill. You've been there, Juan? Yep, yep. With, a, with a good friend, uh, Spike. Anyway, the tip here is you want to get, again, wear uh, boots or neos. And timing is very, very important. So Alex, what he does is he checks the tide chart. So we're in important locations uh, and cool locations at low tide. So the starfish or that you can see the starfish and the anemones and all this other cool stuff. But again, I'm thinking about if I could only take one picture that would tell the story. So I thought, you know, I have a lot of wide angle shots and telephoto shots and macro shots. What would be really different? So I thought I'd try like a 15 millimeter lens. And here's the uh, shot of me actually taking the picture. And there's a close up just down the bottom. So this That's is how commitment. That's commitment. Well, well, it's also commitment. It's also not really thinking because I gave the tip like three times, like use your boots. So yeah, look at, but look your at my boots right, are full of water now. Yeah, <laughs> my, my right boot is like full of water. But uh, you, you're right. I wanted commitment was like really important. Uh, but again, get close. Get close. Uh, this is really important. The closer you are to the subject, the more intimate the picture becomes. So I don't use a, a fisheye lens a lot but I always have it with me because I'm thinking about what story, what story do I want to tell? And I thought that this, the fish I lens here told the story. Okay, you like uh, lighthouses? This is the Coquille Lighthouse on the Oregon coast. Again, there wasn't a lot of color there. And what I wanted to do, what I do is again, when there's not a lot of color, I like to make it a black and white picture. So this has these rocks in the foreground, you know, leading us to this lighthouse. And again, it's a gesture of the water. I took a lot of shots here. The water looks totally different when the waves are coming in than when the waves are going out. And here's just a behind the scenes shot. Uh, that's our <laughs> friend, uh, Spike. Mike Spiker, we were shooting there. And you can see what a flat overcast day it was. I have my boots on. He didn't have his boots on as a Susan knows who's a watching who was with us. I had uh, his feet were like soaked the whole day. We didn't go back to the uh, go back to the hotel. So you definitely want to uh, wear your boots and you can you can't really see it on my camera, but I have a, an ND filter. I have a fixed neutral density filter, uh, which I like to use more than uh, and fixed. But again, from a, a flat overcast day, I shot, I was able to get uh, that shot. So now I have to stop screen sharing if anyone has any comments. Close that. Uh, Arlene's, Arlene mentioned that, um, you know, she's never seen the Kogi Lighthouse from that view. Neither did I. I did not. De you know, our friend failed, failed me because he didn't take <laughs> me to that spot. Well, it's a little dangerous getting down there, and yeah. we advise the people like even though they uh, even though they uh, signed a liability release, we advise them not to uh, not, not to, go to do down. that. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. No, a lot of folks, you know, commented on you know that they they had different opinions whether they liked the black and white or the color images of the ice. I think it was uh, you know some people for them it was black and white, the other one was color. Um, I, I preferred the black and white because like you said, you know, this guy just wasn't, you know, yeah. wasn't doing much. Right. And uh, with black and white, you can make that sky a lot more dramatic. Cool. Oh, which ND filter? I use, a, I use a break field, uh, breakthrough photography uh, ND filters. Uh, very nice photo of the three of you. I always learned something. Oh, that was nice. Thank you. Uh, Morado says that, uh, love the shot. Never looked at the Coquille Lighthouse from that view. Again, it's a little dangerous and uh, we were there. Another tip we should give, I think one for seascape photography is look out for sneaker waves, right? One of <laughs> our friends, John, <laughs> yes. we, sneak, sneaker, meaning that they sneak up on you. Right. And uh, you know, some people unfortunately actually have been killed 
in some of the areas we've been on the Oregon coast because these waves do sneak up on you. And our friend John uh, Mowry- These rogue was, waves all of a sudden show up from nowhere and I've yeah. seen people get taken down. Yeah. So people saw the seahorse. I like the, I like the so, photo. So someone's asking, Robin's asking how many stops is the ND filter? Um, I, I don't know what, what your shot was for the ND filter, but when I'm out there, I usually have um, three ND filters with me. They're fixed. I, you have a three stop, a six stop, and a 10 stop. And I find mm -hmm. that with those three, you know, I can do anything, anything that I want. How about you, Rick? Does that, you find the same? Yep, same ones. Yeah, because you don't know, right? It exactly, depends. you don't know. And you, and, and you could you could stack, you know, if you stack a three stop and a six stop, it doesn't make a nine stop. It, it's actually greater than that. Um, but, you know, stacking oftentimes is kind of a problem because you may get some vignetting, you know, if you're shooting especially wide angle. But, um, and then we, we always use, I always use, and I know Rick does too, the fixed neutral density, not the variable ones. Because the variable ones, you know, the quality is not that great. Typically, they're very expensive. Um, the good ones, the ones that are kind of good, they're not even that great, but they're very expensive. They have, you know, most of them have terrible color casts that are really hard. Yeah. To and then if you dial them in too much, you get artifacts in the in the in the image. So you don't want to use those. As convenient as they may be, I advise against them. Same here. Same here. I see Claudia Cohn is here. She was on the Oregon coast with us. Uh, Mike Cullivan. Hey, Mike, how you doing? Uh, he took us around in his boat. We photographed some nice uh, seascapes up there. There's Claudia. So anyway, guys, uh, we want to thank you for joining us. We want to thank uh, Alec for uh, um, moderating, kick, uh, making sure that we are not bombed. Uh, all clear yeah, here. And Rick, I, I just want to point out over on Facebook uh, earlier in the week, we welcomed, uh, I'm going to get this wrong, so I apologize, either Kaja or Kaja Curtis from Prague, who's listening or yeah. watching us via Facebook. So yeah. we are truly global tonight. Um, so we <laughs> thank you for staying up late and for extending extending your happy hour yeah yeah we put a note up let us know where you're from so people were from uh malaysia uh prague uh canada not too far away i'm trying to look for the post i can't find it but we really do love this uh community and we encourage you again next week it's thursday five o'clock uh, and then on to tuesday we have right we have photo therapy tuesdays where rick and i actually um look at some of your images that you submit, you know, submit to us, you know, Rick, you want to, you or Alec want to talk about that a little bit, how that goes, how that works. Yeah. Uh, this is important on the phototherapy uh, Facebook group, just add the topic. Okay. To your picture, whether it's landscapes, landscape, seascape, flowers, close-ups, on June 16th, because we do this every other week, uh, it's going to be close up. So I'm going to put an announcement out there because there are so many uh, beautiful close ups. So it's hard if you're doing a flower, do I put it in the flower category or the close up uh, category? But that's every Tuesday. Every Monday, we have uh, Linda. We also have something called Photo Linda Marshall with the Meditation Monday. And we also have Photo Mentors Monday. Uh, some of my uh, friends and some of our friends who uh, have been mentors have. Uh, I've written a few things. So we try to keep everyone busy on the phototherapy Facebook page. And it's so much fun. I, I actually, I think, look forward to this because <laughs> the world is crazy. I look forward to this as much as I see Linda smiling here. We talk about how crazy the world and Alec and uh, everyone else, how crazy the world is. So it's so good to see everybody. And Jim, thanks, Jimmy Griggs. Thanks so much. He's from Kansas. Uh, Juan, can you unmute Jimmy just for a minute? Because I know we're getting, uh, or can I? Jimmy Griggs? I, yeah. 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 Jimmy. Uh, hey, had I just told him to, I asked him to unmute that he has to unmute himself. Oh, so if he does it, so Jimmy, there you, you go. Can, can you hear us? Go ahead, Jimmy. You should be able to talk. Okay. You have to unmute yourself, I guess. No, he's, he's unmuted. I don't, I think his uh, microphone may not be working. Oh, well, anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Take those off. Anyway, I go. just wanted to say Juan, you would like to hang out and shoot with this guy because he has bison in Kansas, right? That's right. Absolutely. I mean, you have some amazing shots there. And I met him and you invited me to speak out there. And I forget whether it was a movie theater or a, it was a, a great 
it was a great space. Opera house. It was an opera house. Yeah. So anyway, Jimmy, thanks so much for being a, a moderator along with Alex and uh, Alec and Juan. So we hope everyone has a great weekend. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, Alec, any uh, parting words of wisdom? Well, I'm excited to say that progress is being made because here where Linda and I are in beautiful Bucks County, Pennsylvania, we have gone to yellow and that means we can, if you are adventurous, dine outside. And I was out and about today and it's good to see the world moving again. Yeah. Um, so, and remember Rick, uh, as Rick said, please uh, add a topic to your picture. Yes, very important. Thank uh, you guys. And uh, yeah, we'll see you next Thursday at 5 p.m. Hey, Tommy, I'll have, a, I'll have a nice drink with me to, next week. Well, just don't go to the food truck. And Tommy, right. thanks again. You're, you're an inspiration. Thank you, folks. Well, have a good one. Take care. See you all. Be safe.